My name is Ronald Mudlener. I'm the chair of this dual plenary session on new energy technologies and their status. And I have the pleasure and honor to be the chair of a panel with very distinguished speakers. A sentence to about myself, I'm um, at Aachen University, that's one of the leading universities of technology in Germany. I'm an energy economist and I'm one of five directors of an interdisciplinary and integrated energy research center called the E.ON Energy Research Center. Five professors from four faculties, about 200 staff, and I'm also vice director of a research alliance called Yara that is an umbrella organization for about 2,000 energy researchers. And this is just one uh, sign that we also need larger units because of increasing complexity of all the challenges there are, and they seem to be growing over time rather than diminishing. And that's the setup. I'm very honored to introduce the three panelists briefly, Dr. Akira Yoshino, call him Mr. Lithium Ion Battery because he invented this important element of the energy transition. But of course, that lithium ion battery was also needed for our nice little mobile devices, laptops, smartphones, etc. And I think it was um, just a, a good smell, as he called it himself once, to know what the people really need. And we wanted to have some lightweight uh, devices that needed lightweight batteries. We were going to wireless devices and so on. So all this revolution is an important one in history, but he anticipates the next revolution will be in the field of energy. He is a general manager of the Asahi Kaze Corporation, and he joined this company already back in 1972. And it's Japanese tradition, I take it, to stay with the same company for a very long time. And you can see that Asahi Kaze is still doing very, very well, and maybe quite a large uh, share of that the success is due to Akira. Uh, then we have uh, Sean McCoy, uh, uh, an energy an analyst uh, specializing on carbon capture and storage, and he's now for several years with the International Energy Agency in Paris, but a graduate from Carnegie Mellon University, where he got into economics and public policy, and now he also tries to understand all those interrelationships between engineering and economics and policy making. Very important. And thirdly, we have David Mooney from Enrel. That's also a very large think tank on energy research, as most of you are aware. I think overall they have about two and a half thousand people doing energy related, related research and analysis. And he just mentioned this morning about 150 analysts have now been gathered to deal with all the challenges of the energy transition. He's a center director uh, of the Strategic Energy Analysis Center. So we agreed that each of the three panelists will talk for about 20 minutes in order to save some time for uh, discussion on several topics. And without using more of the precious time, I would love, like to ask Dr. Akira Yashina to come forward to the podium. And recently, it 
it started a new application. Uh, new application means a application for electric vehicle and also the energy storage systems. It started uh, maybe the, uh, five years before. But uh, in this application, there are some issues uh, in the human and battery. So today, I want to talk, mainly I want to talk about the issues and their uh, solutions. Uh, our plan of this, uh, my talk is shown here. First, I briefly, uh, I want to talk about the overview of the Shimanian budget. And the main topic is uh, issues and their uh, direction to Uh, 
price over one hour. Sure, yeah. And then it's not part of the price of the Russian market around 300 Japanese yen over one hour. And lowering it in this way. And now the uh, price of the Russian market is uh, around 220 Japanese yen over what hour. It also uh, it means uh, 0.2 watt hour uh, yes, yes that or uh, 200 over kilowatt hour yes. 200 uh, over kilowatt hour uh, yes that very very thick uh, next I want to move to the main topics uh, issues and direction <coughs> for solutions uh, this slide has sh shown the uh, market outlook of the lithium ion battery for electric vehicle and ESS. ESS means energy storage systems. Uh, this uh, video shows uh, demand forecast of lithium battery use for EV and ES in 2010. In 2010, the uh, forecast uh, is shown here. And uh, <coughs> uh, this bar shows the mobile IP. And this purple bar is this money about for electric vehicle. And the uh, green bar is for uh, ESS. In 2010, the uh, uh, forecast is uh, shown here. But uh, please keep in your mind this is forecast in 2010. And the right uh, figure shows the uh, after track record of Mishima battery use for electric vehicle and ESS in 2013. And uh, this part shows the mobile IP uh, increasing uh, uh, steadily. And this is uh, a powerful bar for EV. Uh, actually, we uh, st started a uh, new market for electric vehicle start, but uh, growing rate is low than expected. Uh, and also the uh, application for ESS, it is not extended at all up to now. Okay. This is the status of the condition of battery. So the uh, <coughs> slow growth of electric uh, and ESS use is due to uh, battery technology. Main issue is shown here. In case of uh, electric vehicle, uh, price of electric vehicle is very high because of, uh, the price of vision uh, battery is high. It is an uh, important issue. And one more important issue is the short driving range of electric vehicle. Uh, it means the uh, uh, poor uh, energy density of lithium battery for electric vehicle. So the uh, lithium battery should be a uh, lower price and also uh, increasing uh, energy density. This is the main issue for electric vehicle and uh, energy storage uh, applications. So uh, next, I want to talk about the uh, solution to the, the direction toward the solution. Uh, first, I will talk to you about short range solutions. Uh, I shall describe a uh, and uh, but important point is to get uh, 
This data is based on cylindrical 18654, cylindrical type, small size, cylindrical additional uh, battery, mainly used for laptop computers. Very small one. This is an uh, 18.650 and uh, very, very high in intensity. But unfortunately, uh, that size additional battery for a uh, week, for example, here, is around uh, in the density of this uh, that size additional uh, battery, in the density around here. This is not close to the in the density of uh, 18654. Also, uh, price. Uh, very low price in the years. Uh, and this is also the, this data is based on 18654, this one. And then now, uh, I say uh, 200 kilo, over kilowatt hour is very, very cheap. But unfortunately, also, that side, the additional battery is around uh, 300 to 400 over kilowatt hour is that about 1.5 or twice time uh, compared with uh, this. Uh, Oh, and so, uh, uh, so the uh, short range solution uh, summarized here. Uh, uh, there are two uh, solutions. One is very, very simple. You need 18650 for electric vehicle or in a storage system. Because uh, this 18650 is a very, very high in density and very, very low price. As you know, the Toyo uh, Tesla Motors Inc. Uh, in the USA use this 18654 for electric vehicle. And uh, it is a wide selection, at least, at least at present. It is one, uh, one, uh, one solution. The second solution is the <coughs> increasing of the uh, energy density of large size emission battery by the level of 18654 and run also the wiring price by the level of 18654. This is a, a second short range solution, I think. <coughs> uh, 18654 has 25 years uh, of history in mind and completed the road, but that side is about only five years of history and not still completed the technology. Experience in the market is required, required to complete technology. Energy density and price of that uh, size is badly approached by the level of 18.654 in two or three years, I believe. Next is the medium range solution. Me medium range solution means the uh, place of cathode or anode materials of additional battery to new material. Uh, material used uh, for this battery, cathode and an anode, and current material and new material is shown here. The current, uh, current uh, material is uh, co cobalt based on uh, cobalt oxygen, called LCO, nickel based MCA, and mixed uh, oxide, LMCO, and manganese also. These materials are used for current and uh, digital battery. And anode is the carbon dioxide material, mainly uh, grow This is a uh, current uh, material. A new material is shown here, for example, uh, this compound, uh, nickel and manganese, and mixed oxide. This compound has very, very high quality, around high four. <laughs> and this material is uh, for uh, solid solution uh, uh, cathode. And uh, this compound has very, very high capacity, uh, around uh, 1.5 times <coughs> the least uh, current material. And uh, I know 
new material, and if you're a candidate for new material, the metallic issue or an issue of metal alloy. So, I want to introduce an uh, example of uh, new uh, commercialized uh, this issue of silicon alloy panel. Starchimax uh, succeeded in commercial production of lithium battery using lithium silicon uh, alloy anode and graphite mix uh, mix anode it mixed with graphite and uh, uh, lithium uh, silicon alloy around the uh, uh, content of this lithium. Uh, Alloy content is around 5%. And that is a density increasing over 25%. So the, this is the second solution. That a perfect replace of the cathode or another material of additional battery to new material is take more time. A partial decrease. Partially increasing in mixing of current and new material with progress gradually and realize increasing of the density and lower <coughs> price. This is the medium range uh, solution. And finally, I want to talk about the uh, long range solution. Long range solution is the creation of new batteries whose electrochemical system are uh, quite different from this one. Um, quite different uh, patterns. For example, uh, uh, metal air battery or sulfur battery. In this case, cathode material is uh, oxygen in uh, air. And also, I know the uh, metallic addition. Uh, and the electrochemical reaction is uh, very, very simple. Uh, and this uh, <coughs> is a uh, very huge. Uh, in case of a sulfur battery, cathode material is a very, very cheap material. And also, I'm always in metal condition. Chemical uh, electrochemical reaction is the uh, here. Uh, this is also very, very simple. Uh, <coughs> um, and this is air and this is sort of battery food electrochemical system are quite different from mission batteries. There's a potential to be at a very huge uh, density. But this battery has, uh, has many serious problems to be solved. So the considerably long time is required by uh, the station. Uh, finally, I want to summarize uh, my talk of map to towards the solution. Uh, now, 2015, 2020, and 2025. And the example of uh, performance is shown here. So, I will make a bit of 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 a bit By the short range solution, the length of the big group extended, extend, will be extended to 300 or uh, 350 kilometers. And uh, here, two or three, yeah, that's uh, And uh, the special uh, 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 2018 is a very, very important uh, year for the uh, people because several uh, people the uh, people start a duty uh, from 2018. It is, uh, uh, I think, uh, this is uh, 20, uh, 2018 is a very of making year. year. <laughs> and we can make the solution will be here commercially uh, around here. And by this uh, uh, improvement, the drive length is uh, over uh, 500 kilometers. And finally, the <coughs> new 
but the system will be made in the other arm here. He will need to buy. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. for each uh, speaker and then we will go into this discussion uh, after that. Is there any very important clarification question? I would have one and that was this uh, sale of EVs as, as a duty after 2018. Oh, yeah. I did not properly understand that. Could you explain that? For yeah. Me? Uh, in uh, California State in USA, uh, new regulation started from 2081. And at the starting point, 4.5% should be a non emission vehicle. And in, in 2025, percentage should be 22%. Very, very severe regulation, I think. Okay, So when we look to our modeling at the IAA, we have uh, the 
several different modeling exercises that go on. Uh, we, we have a business as usual scenario. This is results from the energy technology perspective. So our latest edition, 2015. We have a, a kind of a business as usual scenario, which we've uh, labeled the six degree scenario, or the, over time the temperatures are changing a little bit as sensitivity shifts. So this is still called the six degree scenario. And then we have a, a scenario where emissions are constrained to uh, deliver a, a long-term stabilization at two degrees, roughly. And uh, everything else is the same. And when you look at the technologies that contribute to reducing emissions in this wedge, so the, the integrated area here of emissions reduction, you find that, of course, the first fuel of energy efficiency, as the United States keen to call it, is, uh, is, is probably the most important. Uh, renewables are extremely important, and I think we'll hear more about those in a moment. But then CCS also plays this role as a least cost option to reduce these emissions. So that kind of bolsters some of the things that we've seen out of the IPCC. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about CCS in power. Now, CCS can be used in other applications. It, it's actually today probably most widely used in, in industrial application and fuel transformation, so things like gas processing, for example where it's actually very easy to capture and store CO2. Um, but in power generation, uh, we see it is becoming better because when we look at costs, as I said, it comes out uh, as looking pretty good. Um, and so, so here's some examples from uh, for levelized costs of electricity uh, in, in US dollars per megawatt hour for our two degree scenario in Europe in 2030. So we have a lot of assumptions about fuel pricing and, and these are effectively the shadow prices on the carbon in the model. And you can see that for fossil fuels, uh, gas, and, and coal, uh, that the cost of CCS is lower than the cost of uh, plants without CCS <coughs> in both cases. And then when you look to renewable technologies, and there's a, I think there's a lot of complementarity here, so it's not necessarily a competition, but you do see that there's some, uh, the, the, we think that there's great potential to have cost competitiveness with, uh, with some of these dispatchable uh, generation technologies, uh, things that are easily comparable. To, to power plants with CCS. Um, and then, of course, why does this happen in our, in our model? Well, it's because we have learning rates, right? We have learning by duty, we have learning by r and but we model learning by duty explicitly. And we have something like an 8% uh, doubling of capacity, so an 8% learning rate on uh, carbon capture and storage plants, uh, at least the, the coal type. And so uh, today, there's a capital cost premium uh, you say it probably because it's actually a 2020 number, so like 60%. So building a coal fire power plant with CCS costs you 60% more on capital than it uh, would cost you uh, without that. And so you, that, that premium decreases over time as we move out uh, towards 2050, and we have uh, you know, close to 600 gigawatts of capacity in our model, and you have a, that point under 20%. And energy efficiency of the process goes, uh, it improves as well. Uh, so this is, a, this is the energy penalty, so it goes down. Uh, but it doesn't go down as much because you're now you're working against the laws of thermodynamics, and so I'm going to get to that in, in, in a moment. So I hope I've, I've told you a little bit about why CCS is important and some of the underpinning assumptions. And now I want to drill down on how, where we are today, and how, what are the technologies that might bring us down this learning curve which we see for lots of technology. We, we just saw a great example of the learning curve, essentially for lithium ion batteries. So how, how might CCS come down this curve? Uh, well, to start with, there are three different ways to capture carbon dioxide in power generation. Uh, typically talked about, you have uh, post-combustion uh, capture, uh, pre-combustion capture, and oxy-combustion capture. Uh, and I'm going to start off by just talking about the, the post-combustion route. And so in this route, you're taking your fossil fuel, coal, could be biomass as well. Uh, you're mixing it with air in a boiler. You burn it, release the heat, generate uh, steam. The steam turns the turbine, and you get your, your power out. And of course, you end up with a flue gas. And in this case, you're going to add a system onto the back end of the power plant, as it were, and separate the CO2 out. <coughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that system itself. Most combustion technology, why I picked it to talk about first, is it's very important for, well, for two reasons. One is that we have something between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, 2, gigawatts of coal fired capacity globally. And if you start to think, look at ahead, where are we going to be going? Uh, you have uh, a lot of assets today 
that we are going to have life for a long time moving forward from a technical perspective. Replacing all that would be expensive, so perhaps it's, it's uh, convenient to add CCS to them. And that, again, is a way to reduce cost. And so when we apply some cutoffs for size of plants, to talk about the economies of scale that you might uh, have for capture, and also age, which is related to efficiency of these plants. Uh, so if you look at plants that are 10 years old today, that leaves you with close to 500 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity globally that might be suitable for this sort of retrofit application. And of course, 390 of that are in China. So this is a very important technology, particularly, I think, for the Chinese situation. And it's also important and, and because we have the first large-scale power plant with CCS in operation today. That is a unit called the Boundary, uh, Boundary Dam Unit 3 in the province of Saskatchewan in Canada. It started operation in October 2014. And that plant burns late night. It's uh, 120 megawatts, so it's a relatively small unit. Uh, but it's, 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 it's kind of at hundreds of megawatt scale. It's doing capture of 90% of the carbon dioxide, and at the same time, they had to add air pollution control, so it's capturing 100% of the sulfur dioxide. And it's producing about a million tons per year of carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide, of course, I'm, I'm talking about capture technologies here, has to be stored. And right now, that storage route is through enhanced storage recovery here because it's a revenue stream. The sale of that carbon dioxide to enhanced storage recovery is providing a revenue stream, which is helping support this facility. So, if you look at the, <coughs> if you look at this, this is the capture unit here. Okay, and if we look at that, what's happening there? Well, uh, and, and bear with me as I walk through this worksheet. So we have the flue gas that comes out of the power plant, and it goes into uh, what's called an absorption system, a tower, and it flows upwards in this tower as a liquid flows down. And this is an absorbent. It's usually what's referred to as an amy by, by the chemical engineering community. Uh, it's, a, it's a chemical component. And it uh, flows down, this is flowing down, it strips out, it absorbs the carbon dioxide out of that flue gas. That solvent is then rich in carbon dioxide, circulated over to a uh, stripper. And in that stripper, heat is added, steam is, is generated from the water, and it's an aqueous amine solvent. And you drive off the carbon dioxide, which is then condemned, uh, uh, water is knocked out of it, uh, water is returned, and you, and you take the carbon dioxide for store for transport and storage. And usually you have to compress it to 100 to 150 bar uh, to make it uh, sensible to move by pipeline. And uh, that solvent then gets circulated back, so it's a cyclic process. The solvent is used again and again and again. Okay, so where are the costs? Well, obviously you've got the cost of all this equipment. You have to build all this, so there's the capital cost of the columns, the stripper, the pumps, the vessels, heat exchange, all of that. You then have the cost of energy for separation. You have to, uh, there's a pressure drop in this, in this vessel, and so you have to have a fan that adds, energy, that adds pressure, pressurizes this air, the flue gas coming out, and, and gets it through the vessel. You have pumps, and of course, most notably, you have a bunch of heat, perhaps the most important energy component of the system, that has to go in here in this reboiler to liberate, to help liberate the carbon dioxide to drive that process forward. And so this is the biggest heat. <coughs> And, and note that some of these things are very different inputs. Some are electricity, some are heat. And that's important uh, as, as you look to innovate in, these, in this space. And then, of course, you have cost of energy for compression. Uh, so going forward, I'm going to just talk in a couple of slides about how to reduce the cost of equipment and reduce the cost for separation. I'm not going to say anything about compression. That's not because there aren't cost reductions that could be realized there. It's just that I think they're relatively smaller. And they come more from clever integration of a compressor with the power plant. So I'm going to leave that aside right now. I'm talking about the first two. So in terms of that reduction in capital costs, there's a whole lot of things you can do, in, and this is just a laundry list of them. But you'll notice that a lot of them, uh, for example, the modularization, standardization of components and establishment of supply chains require you to have uh, plants being built. Okay, And so if we can get more of the policies in place that will drive building of these sorts of plants in certain applications, you can start to see these costs come down. Okay? Uh, you can also, if you have more of these plants, expect to see uh, lower financing costs that will be perceived as less risky. Uh, 
And so that should drive the, the, that risk premium down. And a reduction in what's termed uh, contingency costs. And contingency costs are essentially the cost that you have to build into your cost estimate because you aren't sure exactly how much certain things are going to cost. You haven't done it much, or you're and you, need, you have to have some pattern for surprises, essentially. And so the, the, that contingency should come down. So this is one of these things where as we get more of these plants, learning by doing should help us bring down some of the capital costs. And I, and I show this picture here. This is the uh, absorbers uh, from this Sachs power plant. And uh, it's notable because this is an example of clever use of materials. They're in the middle of the Canadian prairies, a long way from uh, places where you build big pressure vessels. And so instead of uh, building tall uh, steel columns, that the sort of things you might see in the picture of a refinery, they said, OK, now we're going to build something with bricks. And so they built a brick. Uh, brick uh, uh, absorber for sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide and lined it with refractory tile. It turned out that that was a way to save money. So it's kind of interesting because you know, if you had asked me as an engineer, well, what does an absorber look like? I wouldn't have said this. I would have said, oh, it's a big column like you see in the refinery. In terms of reducing the energy, actually what we've seen is a long-term trend in, in the reduction of the cost energy penalty for regenerating the salt. That was the red dot that I showed on that figure. Uh, and so this shows the number of uh, the energy required per ton of CO2 that you have to uh, release from solvents so of gigajoules per ton of carbon dioxide over time from 1975 to 2020. And you might think, well, gee, in 1975, no one was doing CCS. No, but lots of people were separating carbon dioxide from gases. Uh, gas sweetening is a perfect example of that. I think this is uh, an interesting point because people talk about CCS, uh, CCS as being new. Well, there are parts of it that are new, certainly the idea of integrating into power generation, but the idea of separating CO2 isn't new at all. But what is, what is different about CCS is you have different comp competitive pressures that are being brought to bear on this sort of separation technology. And it means that in you know, gas separation, you might have to have a fairly high regeneration energy, but it was a very, very small fraction of the energy content of the gas. So it didn't matter as much. Okay? But when you have a power plant technology and you're trying to compete uh, on, on your marginal cost uh, of dispatch, you know, then you really need to have the lowest energy penalty possible for these sort of systems. So what we've seen between, say, 1990 and, and today is a halving of that regeneration energy. And this has come from application of these systems on all kinds of different things. And only out here do you start seeing a lot of data points which relate to uh, CCS applications. But these CCS applications have benefited from this learning by doing. And this trend, uh, we, we expect, should be able to continue for some time. Because if you look at the thermodynamic minimum, okay, the absolute minimum amount of energy it takes to do this separation, it's about point, well, let's say point 0.2. Okay, joules per ton of CO2, and we're at two today. So there's a very big potential to have this cost continue, uh, this energy penalty continue to come down. And that depends on coming up with different and innovative technologies. And they may not be necessarily uh, better solvents. They may be uh, membrane systems. They may be absorption systems where you use a solid to absorb, absorb the CO2. There's all kinds of different ways of doing this. Uh, and so the, the question is, what are those technologies? Uh, and, and they're being researched today. And when we look at this, this is a bit of a breakdown of over time how, I uh, believe this is also a little set of our results for Europe, you see costs come down. You see the biggest reductions happen in capital costs with a significant contribution here from um, the efficiency of the plant. And I, these, these bars are actually related to changes in fuel prices in our, in our assumptions, but these are the big cost reductions that can be expected from learning by doing. So you have the cost coming down, but of course, it will always cost more than doing this without, uh, without carbon capture. Why? Because you have to do work to separate the CO2. It's just nature. Um, one of the key takeaways, though, and I apologize for showing this eye chart for those in the back, is that the costs are going to be much, much higher today. So this is that boundary dam example. This is the, the capture cost, capital cost. And it was something around five or six thousand dollars a kilowatt, depending who you talk to and how you distribute these costs. Whereas a lot of studies that happened between 2007 and 2013, when adjusted to the end of the same cost year, have uh, costs which are much, much lower. And so we need to come down very quickly in 
the near term through these demonstrations and, and work out some of the wrinkles so that we can bring these costs down to where we think they'll be. Okay, and in the last uh, couple minutes, I'm going to talk about a few novel approaches to capturing CO2 that are different than the post combustion route. Why? Well, I showed you those cost curves coming down, and for those of you who work in integrated modeling, you can think about, well, what are you actually, what are those technologies you're actually representing in the model? And, and really, they're just a bunch of numbers that are uh, stuck together, and, and the question is, what do they represent? And we think they could represent something totally different in the future. Uh, they could represent something that has integrated CO2 separation into the power cycle. They could also be something to do with oxy fuel combustion or IGCC plants. Uh, so I'm going to say just quickly about IGCC. Uh, this is where you by the fuel. So IGCC is really attractive. But the main barrier with IGCC today is it turns out building an IGCC without capture is expensive. And there's a couple cases in the US, one without capture, where uh, the plan came in much over the budget. Uh, so they had some cost overruns and time overruns. And there's a second plant under construction with capture. And it's showing uh, similarly large uh, and uh, <coughs> creating some real financial problems for the utility that's doing it. Uh, cost overruns and time overruns. And so there's, there's, there's some challenges here with the first of the kind plans for, for the IGCC. And as I said, this isn't so much related to the capture. This is really related to the IGCC. <coughs> And the last are oxy combustion routes. And this is where you're actually taking uh, oxygen, burning the fuel on oxygen. Instead of doing a CO2 separation, you're doing an air separation. And there's some interesting technologies. And I'm just giving two examples. I'm giving two examples that I think are interesting because this one is actually being demonstrated. This is an oxy combustion cycle for gas. It's called the alum cycle. And the key innovation here is it uses carbon dioxide <coughs> fluid rather than steam or water. So that's something that's quite different, but it also builds on existing steam turbine technology. And this is actually being uh, demonstrated uh, in, in development demonstration uh, in the United States by a, by a group of different companies here and, and some big names there. So we hope that something happens there. And the key takeaway is that this has efficiencies, at least in theory, that should be equal to a combined cycle gas plant without capture. So that's a really would be a really big breakthrough and a way to really bring down cost on that curve. And another example is chemical looping combustion. Uh, I won't say much about this other than it, this is something which has been around for a while. And it's another example of a technology where you're doing something in a different way and, and it's uh, under active research. There's lots of uh, laboratory and pilot scale prototypes. And maybe this is definitely further off than I think than an oxy uh, uh, combustion gas turbine cycle, but it's worth noting. So to leave it at, uh, at the end here with three quick conclusions. Uh, first, CCS can help manage mitigation costs, and that's why we're, we're, we're very interested in, at the IEA, and I think people are generally speaking. Uh, the second is that post-combustion technology is being used in many different places, but it's now being used in power generation, and with uh, uh, some substantial learning by doing, I think we can bring those costs down. And the third point is that uh, there are a lot of improved processes in development and R&D stages and demonstration stages. Um, and, and they need continued R&D support to, to get them into the market and to, again, realize these sort of cost reductions. So uh, with that, I, I will leave it. Thanks so much, Tom. And th the third speaker, David Mooney, is next. And as I said before, we try to save some questions for this discussion at the end. He's the Center Director of the Strategic Energy Analysis Center at NREL in Golden, Colorado, and will give us a systematic, systemic and strategic perspective, I think. Set my, set my timer here first. So I, uh... Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here speak today. Um, want to uh, talk to you a little bit, give you a little bit of context about what's happening uh, with the commercialization of renewable technologies and uh, focus in a little bit on uh, some of the challenges we face in integrating large amounts of variable generators, wind and solar particularly, uh, into the existing power systems. 
a little bit about uh, a little bit about our organization first. The National Renewable Energy Lab is uh, is a laboratory of the U.S. Department of Energy. We're one of uh, 17 labs, but the only lab that has uh, as its mission uh, dedication to the uh, research and development and eventual commercialization of renewable and efficiency technologies. We're uh, very uh, we consider ourselves to be a very market facing laboratory in that the, the R&D that we conduct is uh, very much geared toward uh, ensuring that uh, the technology we're developing has characteristics that are commercializable and uh, we want to see those technologies into the marketplace because our, uh, our fundamental mission really is to, uh, uh, is to see a transformation, is to enable a transformation in the energy system from the system that you see on the left uh, that has uh, characteristics that are uh, uh, in many cases unfavorable. Uh, moving to the system characteristics that you see on the right, while maintaining uh, what are two <coughs> extraordinarily favorable characteristics of our existing system, uh, in, in, that is uh, reliability and affordability. But we uh, very much are motivated by moving toward a carbon neutral uh, energy system. So uh, we have been doing research and development in these technologies for several decades at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And uh, uh, thank thankfully, uh, from the efforts of many of our scientists in collaboration globally with scientists uh, who have been tackling these problems for decades. Uh, there is a transformation underway. I'm going to flip through a series of uh, charts, not necessarily meant to uh, look at the details of the charts, but the trends, the cost numbers are given in the blue bars. And this is for uh, land-based wind technology. And the deployment levels are shown by the green lines in these, in these coming charts. And you can see uh, the trend will be the same in each of them. Um, the dramatic reductions in cost uh, while uh, co with commensurate increases in uh, deployment. So land-based wind, uh, as everyone knows at this point, is, uh, uh, is a very large industry. Deployment levels are very high with, uh, with uh, offshore wind becoming uh, more and more viable. Uh, fewer years covered here, but the same story with uh, photovoltaics, uh, uh, very dramatic cost reductions. This chart, regrettably, actually ends in 12, uh, 2012. The last two years uh, have seen even more dramatic cost reductions and, and deployment increases. Uh, 2014 saw, saw globally about, uh, uh, about 160 gigawatts deployed worldwide. Uh, LED light bulbs, uh, the same story with LED light bulbs, uh, assisting on the demand side in uh, reducing energy demand, uh, fairly dramatic cost decreases and deployment is rapidly increasing. In fact, in, in, many, uh, in many stores in the U.S. now, uh, you go in, and, uh, whereas just really five years ago, incandescent and compact fluorescence dominated uh, the the main products on the shelves now, you see mostly uh, LED light bulbs. And electric cars as well. A couple of data gaps in, in this chart, but the trend is, uh, is uh, still showing in uh, cost reductions and deployment increases in the U.S. Uh, tens of thousands of electric vehicles being sold in a year in the U.S. So, uh, the, the impact of this is, is really starting to show. You know, since uh, 2008 in the U.S., um, electricity generation has increased threefold by wind and solar. So uh, becoming a measurable mix of our, uh, of our energy generation in the U.S. Um, more than 50% uh, in 2012 of all uh, generating capacity globally was uh, toward clean energy and renewable energy technologies. And Citibank is projecting that uh, there will be uh, needed nearly 10 billion, uh, 10 trillion, sorry, 10 trillion dollars of investment by 2035 in renewable technologies and almost three quarters of that will, will be in renewables. I'm sorry, the, uh, the total investment 10 trillion for all generating technologies and about three quarters of that in going toward renewables. So there, um, uh, this, this transformation 
is um, is underway. I'm just having trouble getting the advance there. And, and part of the result of this uh, is some very encouraging, uh, a very encouraging economic news. Uh, the IAA is reporting that globally, about seven uh, seven point seven million people are employed in the renewable energy business. Uh, a pretty significant number, and uh, it's growing uh, fairly dramatically every year. And in uh, 2014, more than a quarter of a trillion dollars was invested in, uh, in clean energy technologies. So um, this is uh, uh, this is a transformation that's uh, that's happening. But uh, there is quite a bit more possible, and this is where uh, we spend much of our time at the at the National Renewable Energy Lab at this point is in uh, imagining what other. Uh, what other systems could be possible, but we're not the only ones. There are a number of studies now, both by uh, private sector companies and uh, national laboratories and universities that are all reaching uh, similar conclusions, and that is that uh, uh, there is more possible that uh, we can deploy much larger numbers of uh, renewable energy technologies and uh, maintain the reliability and affordability of the system that, uh, uh, that we see today. I'm not trying to say that uh, that this transformation costs nothing. Uh, it will cost something, uh, but there are also costs associated with uh, with doing nothing uh, with the system. I want to focus in though on uh, one particular study that we did. It was the first one that came up in, in the animation. Uh, it's a study we call the Renewable Electricity Future Study, and uh, what we did we focused on the continental. United States in this study, the power system in the U.S., and we examined a number of different scenarios, uh, ranging from uh, these scenarios were out to the year 2050. But we looked at uh, anywhere from 30 percent to 90 percent of electricity demand being uh, supplied by renewable technologies. And uh, our, the purpose of this was to uh, do a couple of things. We wanted to see. Uh, if we, uh, if, what a system uh, that had that much renewables in it looked like, and then could we operate it? Uh, a couple of, of really key questions. Now, uh, uh, regrettably, we determined prior to the start of the session that the computer here doesn't have uh, doesn't have quick time on, so I can't show you the animation. So I'll talk through this a little bit. Uh, it was a lovely, uh, lovely animation showing. Uh, uh, showing the operation of the power system for two weeks in the year 2050. Uh, what the scenario that we focus on, this study is available online for download. Uh, we, we ended up doing most of our analysis around the 80% scenario. So 80% of, uh, of technology, or 80% of demand, sorry, uh, being supplied by uh, the biomass, geothermal, hydropower, concentrated solar power with storage, photovoltaics, wind, and uh, the balance, the 20% being uh, supplied by fossil and nuclear. Uh, how we approached the study is that we, uh, we developed at, at NREL over the course of the last uh, seven or eight years a capacity expansion model that has, uh, uh, that, that focuses on capturing the, some of the unique characteristics of uh, renewables. And, uh, the capacity expansion model, uh, we're able to put in the constraints of the endpoint that we want. So we build out the system using the capacity expansion model to 2050 with the constraints that we want. 80% uh, of, of uh, production, 80% of consumption being met by uh, renewables, the renewable mix that you see here. And, and just as a detail, um, 50, uh, of the 80%, 50% is uh, by wind and solar, 35 percent wind, 15 percent solar. So a, a very large amount of the variable generators. The, uh, as you can imagine, the, the bio, di, di, direct fire, uh, biopower, and geothermal can serve as base load as well as, as hydro. Uh, so once we uh, build out that, that system using the capacity expansion model, which also uh, has modeled in it the entire transmission system of the U.S. and does uh, transmission uh, capacity expansion as well as <coughs> capacity expansion. Uh, once we had that system uh, hypothetically built out in the model, uh, we we 
input that system into the Plexo's production cost model. This is a, uh, a production